We are getting near the end of our least squares module, and in this video, we are looking at integer variables. These types of variables show up regularly in multiple linear regression models. For example, what if you wanted to indicate that you use method A or method B to process your raw materials? You can only use method A or B. There's nothing in between. It is not a continuous variable. You can't process the material midway between A and B. If you look back at a prior example on second-hand cars, we had convertible cars and regular cars. How could we have included that information in our multiple linear regression model? What if you wanted to indicate the difference between the morning shift and the evening shift on your process? We might know that the morning shift produces higher yields than the evening shift, so we want to include that knowledge when we make our predictions. All of those are good examples of integer variables, but let me use a new example here and I'll expand on it over the next few minutes. Consider the case where you wish to build a least squares model to predict the yield from your batch reactor. In your model, you want to use the temperature, which you know affects the yield, as well as the impeller type, whether it is a radial impeller or an axial impeller. With your current knowledge of least squares modeling, what you would do is to go build a single prediction model using temperature to predict yield only for the radial impeller case. Then you would go build a second least squares model to predict the yield from temperature for the axial impeller case. Two different least squares models, both using temperatures to both predict yield. That is an inefficient use of your data. The effect of temperature for the axial and the radial case are likely the same or similar. By building two separate models, you lose degrees of freedom in each of those individual cases. We've learned from our confidence interval section that having a higher number of degrees of freedom leads to narrower confidence intervals. In other words, a confidence interval that has a greater degree of certainty for yourself. So it is desirable to keep those degrees of freedom as high as you can. Combining the data means that the number of data points n increases, so you'll have these greater degrees of freedom, and the standard error can potentially decrease. Again, that's desirable. Building a unified least squares model that incorporates this discrete nature of some of our input variables, such as radial versus axial impeller, is very desirable. One way we can do that is to include a new type of variable in our regression model, which we will call a coded variable, or an integer variable. Let's take a look here at the population model for this case. y is equal to some intercept, beta 0, plus beta 1 times t, with beta 1 representing the effect of temperature, plus gamma times d, where d represents the type of impeller, and then finally add an error term. When we go estimate the model parameters, we will estimate an intercept B0, we will estimate a slope B1 for temperature, and we will go estimate a slope G for the impeller effect, multiplied by DI. DI is what we call our coded variable. We set it equal to 0 if we're using an axial impeller. We set DI equal to 1 when we are using a radial impeller. It's very easy to make a prediction from this model. DI takes on values of either 0 or 1. No other values are possible for it. Now let's go take a look at how we might interpret the effect of G times DI in that model. To do that, I'm going to temporarily assume that temperature has no effect, so we can simplify our geometric interpretation. So now Y is equal to an intercept plus G times DI. For the case of axial impellers, when DI is equal to 0, our output from this model is simply that y is equal to b0, the intercept. For the case of radial impellers, where di is equal to 1, our output from the model is equal to y is equal to an intercept plus g. There's a certain distance, g, between the intercept, b0, and this other line, b0 plus g. As long as g is non-zero, it indicates to us the effect of changing from the axial impeller to the radial impeller. We have to be clear on that interpretation. It is the incremental effect of going from the axial impeller to the radial impeller. Imagine you built a least squares model for this and calculated a confidence interval for gamma, which is being estimated by G. As long as that confidence interval for the population effect of the impeller, gamma, does not span zero, we can say that the impeller has a significant effect on the output Y. If that confidence interval did span zero, then we would say that the impeller has no statistically significant effect on the output y. Now let's bring the effect of temperature back. Let's assume that the coefficient b1 is non-zero, and then we can go write out this equation twice. 
one's for axial impellers with a plus zero term here at the end, and one's for radial impellers with a plus g term at the end. The key thing to notice is that our interpretation of this amount g is still the same. It is not modified by the effect of the b1 times t term. For example, if g had a value of minus 56 micrograms, then it indicates that we expect a decrease in the yield of 56 micrograms when we change from an axial to a radial impeller, controlling for temperature. Geometrically, we can visualize this as we've seen before. We have a three-dimensional plot, but this time, the axis is going into and out of the screen, the d-axis. It is either a value of zero here at the front with open circles, or a value of 1 at the back with closed circles for the radial impeller case. The least squares plane passes through this cloud of points, but what is different is that these points are clustered only at 0 on the d-axis or only at 1. It is not possible to have points somewhere in between, or above 1 or below 0. Even though algebraically the prediction equation for y hat allows you to go put in any value of d, the model is technically undefined at the values that are not equal to 0 or 1 for d. Geometrically, you can see for this particular model that the effect of temperature, the slope coefficient as seen from the x1 axis perspective, can be interpreted for both the axial impeller or for the radial impeller case. If the effect of temperature truly was the same for radial impellers and the effect of temperature was exactly the same for axial impellers, that slope coefficient will be the same. These two lines are parallel to each other, just offset. In fact, the model that we have used here, y is equal to an intercept, plus b1 times t, plus g times di, forces the slope coefficient for the temperature, b1, to be the same value for both radial and axial impellers. We will relax that assumption later on, which will allow the slope coefficient to be different for the two cases, but we'll have to wait for the section on designed experiments before we see that. To summarize so far, our interpretation of the slope coefficient when we deal with integer variables is no different to that from before. You just have to be aware of which value you set as 0 or 1 and interpret it as the incremental change when going from the 0 case to the 1 case. The interpretation of confidence intervals for integer variables is no different to that for continuous variables. The final piece that I want to close off this video with is to look at the case where our integer variables take on more than two levels. Consider a new example where we know that our raw material has an effect on the output y and we happen to acquire our raw material from three countries, Spain, India or Vietnam. We say that our integer variable has three levels and we can code that with three minus one new variables, in other words two new integer variables are required. Let's call them d1 and d2 in this particular example. The choice you make for how you assign d1 and d2 is arbitrary. We could set d1 equal to 0 and d2 equal to 0 for Spain. Then we might set d1 equal to 1 and d2 kept at 0 for India. And finally, we can choose to set d1 to 0 and d2 equal to 1 for the case for Vietnam. Now let's go interpret the d1 coefficient. It is the average change in y expected when we use raw materials from India as compared to Spain. In other words, it's the incremental amount by which y changes when we process raw materials from India compared to our baseline of Spain. Can you interpret the d2 value on your own? You should interpret it as the incremental effect on y when we move our raw material supplier from Spain to Vietnam the incremental amount from Vietnam to our baseline of Spain. Always be clear on those individual interpretations. It certainly gets more messy when you've got multiple integer levels in your model. I want to close by emphasizing that the interpretation of these coefficients, d1 and d2, is no different to that from before. They're just the incremental changes. The interpretation of their confidence intervals is no different to the case from continuous variables. We would look for confidence intervals that either don't span zero or do span zero to determine whether the particular integer variable has a significant effect or doesn't have a significant effect, respectively, on the output value y.